Hey, it's time for voiceover body shop. How's everybody doing out there? Uh, tonight we got a guest because, uh, and a great guest because believe it or not, this is our 12th anniversary of doing voiceover body shop. You can throw that up there now, Sue. <laughs> there we go. All right. And because we're celebrating 12 years, we have a very, very special guest, our good friend, Scott Brick. Say hi, Scott. Hey there. It's good to be back. It's, it's great, great to see you guys. Great to have you. All right. If you've got a question for Scott about audiobooks or anything else that he's willing to talk about, I guess, throw it in the Facebook chat or in the YouTube chat, and uh, depending on where you're watching, and we will get to that question too sweet, whatever that means. I think that means right away afterwards, after our second, you know, during our second segment, after we do the first break. Anyway, <laughs> you ready, George? I'm ready to go. It's voiceover body shop with Scott Brick right now. Now. It's time for voiceover body shop. Brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, the home of Harlan Hogan's signature products. Source Elements, the makers of Source Connect. VoiceOver Heroes, become a hero to your clients with award-winning voiceover training. VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your voice actor website doesn't have to be a pain in the butt. VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for voiceover success. And World Voices, the industry association of freelance voice talent. And now, here's your hosts, Dan and George. Well, greetings, everyone. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver Body Shop. Or VO BS. All righty. 12 years. This is actually our, the actual 12th anniversary is March 22nd. But since it's March 20th, Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we've been doing this show for 12 years now. I mean, literally s since, since I was in Buffalo and you were in Santa Monica and, uh, it has been quite the journey and we're just going to keep going here. <laughs> it's that's we, right. It's like, we don't get bored with this. This is what we do every day. And if we got bored with it, we would go do something else. I was looking in the archives. The last EWABS East West audio body shop was episode 195 on july 6th 2015 15, yeah so vobs has been happening since 2015 so we've been doing the vobs version for a lot longer now than ewabs which is kind of mind-blowing <laughs> yeah considering we used to do it every week that's right we did do it every week now we're doing the flip-flop the interview and the tech right. talk and i think it paces out lovely it i hope you guys agree fresh fresh content every week and speaking of fresh content, we have a great guest tonight. Let me introduce him because we want to have as much time as possible with him. And uh, Scott Brick is an actor, writer, and award-winning narrator of over 800 audiobooks. Wow. Including popular titles such as Washington, A Life, Moneyball, Cloud Atlas, A Princess of Mars, the whole Born series by Robert Ludlum, and many other high-profile authors. He also coaches talent and does many appearances in webinars and video conferences. One of our favorite people here on the VoiceOver Body Shop. Let's welcome back Scott Brick. Scott, how are you doing? I'm great. I'm much better now that I'm seeing you guys again. So hey. great to be here. All right, we'll take that as a compliment. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <absolutely. laughs> we would have I've liked to have I did a show from my booth downstairs when it first opened. I want to say it's 2010, something like that. Then I did another show. We were at Vio Atlanta. It was right. a live thing on stage. I did another one. I came to your place, Dan. Uh, yeah. I think it was my fourth, uh, my fourth time here with you guys, and it's always a pleasure. Oh yeah. wow! Good Over to see you back. Years, that's once every three years, if my math is correct. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> Which is amazing in itself, if you know anything about my math skills. Um, <laughs> Anyway, yeah, it was. It's always great to have you here. And of course, you 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 wanted to come here this time because you wanted to see you know the improvements to the bathroom. And I stuff. wanted to see about the last time that we did this. It was in person. It was before the pandemic, and I fell. I am just a man in love with your bathroom, Dan. 
It's just the way it is. The way that you have decorated that thing, you got an old floor model radio and you hollowed it out and you put a, you put a, a, a sink into it. I yep. just sat there as an old time radio fan and just went, Oh my God, how do I get one of these? How do I make this happen? <laughs> well, you know, you can come and use my bathroom anytime you want, Scott. So it's, can you give me a key? <laughs> sure. That'd be, that'd, be, that'd be wonderful. Give him the bathroom door code. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you are like you are the guy when it comes to audiobook narration, you know, as you can tell. I mean, over eight hundred titles. I mean, I did like forty, and I thought that was a lot. Um, <laughs> tell us a little bit about your background and your training, and what brought you to to doing audiobooks. Um. My training is I, I, uh, I mean, when I got into college, I, I went to UCLA uh, in the theater department, uh, which is really interesting because now I'm back at UCLA teaching in the theater department. They brought me back to teach their grad students, their graduate acting students, audiobook narration, which is crazy. Um, really? Been doing that for about seven years now. And, uh, uh, you know, look, we were talking about her off camera as we were getting set up. I did a lot of Shakespeare uh, in in college as well as afterward. I did 10 years on and off with a traveling Shakespeare company. And, and I think it's really important for voiceover performers um, because there's one really valuable tool that you learn when you're doing Shakespeare. Um, in Shakespeare, the, the text is everything. However, there's punctuation. And as I've always said, Pat Fraley and I agree on this. Uh, there are times you have to dishonor the punctuation. And I think when the more you perform Shakespeare, the more you realize that there are going to be times where if you followed the punctuation in the text slavishly, it would not serve the author's intent. If, it, if, if that was the case, then you would, um, uh, you would, you could, pronounce this line this way who do you think you are anyway <laughs> yeah you know the fact of the matter is punctuation doesn't exist there's no such thing as punctuation in human speech all there are are pauses and full stops and drifting off as you come to the end of an idea and you just kind of run out of what to say and you know authors since the dawn of time have come up with this system where we try to approximate those pauses and full stops and what have you. And um, you have to realize at some point in, in order to get the author's idea across, sometimes you have to dishonor the punctuation. And I think Shakespeare was really certainly helpful for me in learning how to do that. Yeah. Did you do any other classical type of theater uh, along, along with Shakespeare? Sure. Yeah. One of my, uh, I think that my favorite experience ever on stage was playing Cyrano, uh, uh, which is certainly a, a, a couple of hundred years more recent than, uh, than Shakespeare. I think it was written in 1898, but it was set, uh, not long after Shakespeare's death, um, uh, 1640, I think. And so, yeah, uh, I, <laughs> I did a lot of what I called long hair roles. Uh, and, and I and I had the oh my god I had the longest craziest longest hair and thank God none of those photos exist uh, that would be <laughs> genuinely embarrassing. This pre-internet is that what you're saying? Uh, <laughs> yes. Don't go looking for them, anybody. Don't go looking. <laughs> so how did you? So you you studied theater, but you were saying that the, you were actually had a course in audiobook narration. Is this what you've been doing since the start, or was there, you know, like working at McDonald's in in between there? Or? <laughs> I worked. I worked at a um, at an at a bank in Beverly Hills for seven years. Right when I got out of UCLA, I did this while I was doing Shakespeare because the Shakespeare was a was a part time gig, and and uh, I wasn't able uh, because of union rules at the time. I wasn't able to um, uh, get insurance and. Uh, uh, as a result of it, and I have diabetes, so I, I stayed with a, a desk job, the, the bank job, for seven years. And I will never forget my, my former pastor. He had gotten out of the ministry, and he had become a, um, a coach, a private coach. 
um, kind of your own personal Tony Robbins. And he, uh, uh, I hired him to try to, because I, I wasn't happy where I was in life, what I wasn't doing, what I felt like I was born to do. And he, he said to me one time after like six or seven or eight or 10 weeks of just bitching and moaning about my day job, he, he looked at me and there was no smile on his face. There was no sense of, of being facetious or anything. He said, do you need permission to quit your job? <laughs> and I said, what? He said, look, we, we meet every week and you say the same thing. Every, you say the same thing every week, but you're not, you're not changing anything. You're not making that change. And I'm wondering if you need permission to quit, because if you do, I give you mine. You have my permission to quit. Oh, great yeah. advice. It really is. It really is. And I have found myself doing that with a lot of voiceover people in, in whatever genre flavor of voiceover they're, they're working in, um, whether it's promo or radio or, you know, or audiobooks. Um, my, my, my fiance, Suzanne, when she was, when I, the day I met her, she said, well, I'm, I, I've got a, I've got a job that I'm working in and, and uh, I kind of need to finish that. It'll take me about six months, but then I think I'm going to go full time. And I said, well, why not quit now? Not, not in a way to be like provocative, but I'm right. always like, well, why not cut the cord right now? Follow your dreams. <laughs> and she said she worked for an event management corporation and the event was the Dalai Lama's 80th birthday mm. with, uh, you know, 20,000 of his closest friends at uh, the Irvine Spectrum. And I was like, oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, stay stay in that for six months. That, that, <laughs> that, makes, that makes all the sense in the world. But afterwards, I'm always, you know, trying to encourage people to to make the leap. Yeah. Once again, we're talking with Scott Brick. Uh, be talking about audiobooks. And if you've got a question for Scott, again, throw it in the chat room. You know where it is if you're watching on Facebook or if you're watching on YouTube Live. We're also on LinkedIn now, too, on the VoiceOver Body Shop page on LinkedIn. I'm not exactly sure how it works or if it works. I just clicked go to LinkedIn, and so it should be working anyway. So how many books can you do at a time? Because I'm, I'm going to assume you either try to do it one at a time or you've got several projects going at the same time. Uh, I don't recommend doing more than I one wouldn't either. But <laughs> uh, No, it's, it's horrible. Um, you know, as you all know, we're, we're about to leave for VO Atlanta. And, uh, up until about half an hour ago, I was working on a Tom Clancy book that I'm not going to be able to finish, um, before leaving, I'm going to have to pick it up when we get back. And I know that, you know, in the 10 days, uh, cause we're going to New York afterwards for the audio awards and such, all the audiobook festivities. By the time I get back to my booth, I'm not going to remember what I did with any of these characters. So I'm dropping markers left, right, and center. I'm like, oh, God. Oh, God. Okay. Um, <laughs> the most I've ever worked on at the same time is four titles at once. And You wouldn't recommend that doing that again. <laughs> special kind of, that was a special kind of awful. Yeah. But, I'm uh, I'm, but I got it done. I'm, sh I'm sure it is. Um What's involved in producing your books? When, when you get, you get a, a gig from somewhere, what's your process of what goes into, you know, preparation and recording and then sending it wherever it is it's supposed to go? Um, I have two first steps, one for me and one for somebody who works with me. Um, uh, you have to know how to pronounce everything. Uh, whether it's a, a word, a phrase, a proper name, um, um, an acronym, you know, forward operating base in the military, FOB. It's FOB, yes. Yeah. Oh, right. Um, and I always thought it would be called an FOB because calling it a FOB, like a like a watch FOB from 100 years ago, I, uh, I thought, no, that can't be right. But I called my best friend's brother, <laughs> the colonel in the military, and I said, dude, I really need your help. I'm working on a, I'm working on a really high profile title and I need to know. Uh, they talk about forward operating base Tillman. It was a book about the life of Pat Tillman who died by friendly fire. He was the former NFL player um, uh, who died tragically in Afghanistan. And I said, I need to know. I said FOB. And he goes, oh no, it's FOB. I said, are you sure? 
yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I know, but here's the thing. And I started explaining, and I feel like I was mansplaining to another guy, right? <laughs> and finally he said, uh, Scott, not to interrupt you, but I am calling you from Fob Tillman. <laughs> Which I got to be honest was a little in a, 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 a little humbling. I'm um, sure. I said, okay, I'm going to shut the hell up now. Um, <laughs> you have to do things like that, and so I rely on my researcher George Weisberg, a mm. marvelous guy. If anybody in the audience wants to hire him, please do. He's a freelancer. George George Weisberg, two S's at gmail.com. He's wonderful. He's got a whole staff. He can help you. Um, First time I get a manuscript, I send it off to him. As he is working on it, what I do is I look at the text and I have, the first thing I have to do is determine who is the protagonist. Most people think that's a really easy decision to make. It's the lead character, but it's not. The protagonist isn't the lead character. The protagonist is the character who changes. Um, look at Star Trek, right? Uh, uh, William Shatner was the you know he was the first name in the credits. Right. He's the captain, yeah. but he's not the protagonist. The protagonist is Spock because he's the one who changes. Uh, same thing. Uh, uh, the Big Bang Theory. It's not Leonard who Johnny Gasecki. You know he's the the main character in the in the credits. No, it's Sheldon. Sheldon is the character who changes. So identify who the where the change occurs, and then map it. I, I do kind of an arc. Um, uh, okay, whatever the issue is, uh, if he is an intolerant human being here, but at the end, he is far more tolerant over here, then every time that issue comes up, I have to raise the stakes each time. So that by the time that we get here, it's not a surprise. All right. And That's then... primarily the work that I right. do. And well, and preparation is important for anything you do, but for audiobooks, I would think that, you know, some guys say, well, I just read through it. You know, I, I can yeah. read it cold. And, you know, if you know the author, well, you can sort of get away with that. But, you know, it's, I, I would imagine that, you, do you read the whole book beforehand? Usually, I, I mean, I always try to, uh, but there are times where I don't have the chance. Um, um Sometimes that's easier if it's a nonfiction book. I mean, I, I please don't think I'm making light of this, but you know, if it's about a war, well, I know who won. Um, <laughs> if it's a, you know, if it's about JFK, well, I know what happens at the end of the story, um, and I can get away with not reading it. Then, as long as I'm prepared, as long as I've paid somebody who prepares me, um, but also like even when I'm working on fiction, sometimes. Uh, if I get a crazy turnaround deadline, hey, desperate, we need this in eight days, I'm not going to be able to do that prep. Right. So I will pay somebody to read it for me and break it down into a very detailed um, book report, essentially. Oh, they yeah. break it down chapter by chapter. This is what the main character wants. This is what the main character needs in this scene. Those are two totally different things sometimes. So. Right. Once again, we're talking with Scott Brick about audiobooks and reading audiobooks and narrating audiobooks. If you've got a question about that, again, you can throw it in the chat room because we have three chat rooms now. This, you, George, you said somebody actually chimed in from LinkedIn? Me. Oh, you chimed in from LinkedIn. <laughs> I jumped on the LinkedIn and, and typed into the chat on LinkedIn to see that it works. And it and shows up right here in our um stream yard feed so we see oh. all three chats right here live on right. the show which is awesome no matter where you are we can get your questions that's right so uh, throw them in any one of those chat rooms and we will get to those questions in just a little bit with scott uh how do you book your work i mean how do you book book work hmm. i've got an next session uh coming up at vo atlanta um it's called book that book uh <laughs> you know, how do you, how do you land the gig? Um, I have agents, of course, but my agents, the amount of work that I get through my agents are maybe a, a half a dozen books per year. Um, you know, once I've already got a relationship with a publisher, the publisher typically comes straight to me. And I worked all the nuances of that out with my agent. So nobody gets upset. Um, I, I, I pay them 
absolutely they're due. Uh, pay your agents, people. Um, uh, but then I've also got a very active uh, production manager through my website. And when people are interested in having me do their work, this is typically if it's a, hmm, an independently published author, mm -hmm. uh, they'll reach out to Gina, Gina Smith, my production manager, and she will, she'll tell me about it. And she's like, okay, here are the broad strokes. It's a book about a guy who, you know, this, this, and this, I've got things that I just don't want to talk about. I, I, you know, there, there are political issues. I just, you know, they, they infuriate me. And it's like, I don't want to live with that for a week. And I don't want to deal with the anger that's going to result from this. Um, I, I've made it very clear. We're not going to do any books about child abuse. I just, I don't want to cry for an entire week of my life. <laughs> um, so uh, she'll give me the broad strokes and say, does it sound interesting? At which point I say, sure, let's, let's look it up. At which point she sends it to a mutual friend of ours, uh, one of her best friends um, that I met through Gina. And uh, she used to work at um, movie studios and she does what's called coverage. Uh, for somebody who writes a screenplay, you send it into a Warner Brothers or Universal or Paramount. Um, hey, would you, would you produce my film? First thing they do is they hire somebody to do coverage for it. It tells you what the themes are. It tells you what the overall plot is. And then it gives you a spot for a recommendation. And she is so good at her job. She's been doing this for studios for so long that when she comes back to me and says, yeah, I really enjoyed this book. Uh, I'll say, great. Let's put her on the schedule. Hmm. How many, how many do you have like lined up in a row right now? You know, looking ahead over the next couple of months. Uh, I filled out my production calendar a week ago, and I think we had 13 titles, uh, no, which is about, you know, three or four months. Yeah. All right. Well, that, that explains a number of things, but everyone seems to want to get into audiobooks these days. Mm -hmm. You know, George and I are working with people a lot of times. It's like, I want to do audiobooks. Why do you think that is? What is it? Is there an attraction to it? Yeah. Well, I think there's, um, I, uh, look, uh, audiobooks are the only growing part of publishing, right? You've seen your copy of the LA Times dwindle from this size to this size. And, um, you know, print publishing is, uh, I hope not on its way out, but it's certainly uh, been relegated to a much smaller position. Um, and uh, audiobooks are growing, and I think the reason for that is um, it's cultural. It's the fact that we we were read to as children, and I think we miss it. I think that's why we listen to audiobooks so much. Uh, I got interviewed by the Wall Street Journal years ago, and and it was I was you know you, you, you try not to lead the witness, you try not to you know try to you know lead. Uh, you know, for the, for the answer that you're looking for as a, as a reporter, they were like, do you think the importance of, or the, the growth of audiobooks has something to do with the proliferation of, you know, uh, uh, technology and the fact that we can now listen on our cell phones? Do you think <laughs> it might have anything to do with that? And I said, no, I said, no. And then I gave them the answer that I just gave you. Oh my God, you would have thought I'd farted in church. <laughs> <laughs> but it's 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 a fundamental thing in culture. I, you know, we we miss being read to, and I think as such, there is a uh, certainly among voiceover people, there is a uh, I don't know, just a um, an overall cultural memory, racial memory. I think is another way that they've referred to it. And look, I I work with a lot of people who are retirement age plus and they're trying to rebrand themselves so they're trying to you know start their they want to make their golden years more important than what they were doing in their day job for 40 years and uh so many people i know have said to me i don't need to to you know 
balance another checkbook. I don't need to do, you know, the job I was doing before. Hillary Huber was once said to me, I don't need to do another Tide commercial. Please, Tide, don't take that the wrong way. Feel free to hire me if you want me to do a Tide commercial. But <laughs> And I don't mean to, to judge the people who are doing Tide commercials. But as Hillary said to me, at the end of my life, I'm not going to wish I had done one more Tide commercial. But I probably will wish I had done one more audio. Because cool. you're, it's it's something that you can kind of leave behind you. Absolutely, that's a, that's a great way to look at that. Again, if you've got a question for Scott Brick about audiobooks, throw it in there. Here's a topic that I, I really wanted to get into you with a, a little bit because I mean, as you say, you you teach, you coach, you you do a lot of webinars, and because I keep seeing your face popping up just about everywhere. Hey, Scott Brick's going to be here. Scott Brick's it's annoying, be here. isn't it? It's and annoying. it's no, it's not. It's like, well, I'm glad I'm glad somebody's making a living. Um, <laughs> Give us your thoughts on what is the state of the audiobook industry in 2023? Um, stronger than ever, despite the worries about AI, um, despite publishing being on a bit of a downturn, not as bad as it was a couple of years ago, um, the audiobook industry is in really good hands. And that's primarily because of all of the many disparate uh, varying voices that we have. Something we learned after the murder of George Floyd, um, people started paying attention to things like representation and inclusion. And uh, I think audiobooks have never been stronger since then. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's something I'm proud of. It's something I, I'm, I'm proud of our industry for. It's not like I have anything to do with it, but... Um, um, I remember uh, working with one of my dearest friends, Dan Musselman. He was the uh, the producer at Random House for many years, and Penguin Random House, of course, after the merger. And he just retired recently. And and I asked him one time why he put so much effort into training newcomers. And he then challenged me. He said, well, you, you work with a lot of new narrators. Why do you do it? And I said, I asked you first. <laughs> and he said, I think our answer is the same. He said, the audiobook industry has been very good to me. It's given me everything I've always wanted in this life. And there will come a time where I'm not going to be in it anymore. And I want to make sure that the people coming up in the industry know how to appreciate that and how to appreciate the industry, how to perform in the industry. He said, it's kind of like when you're, when you're doing a Shakespeare show somewhere in, in, in one of the performances, if you're performing Shakespeare, you know that someone adult or child will be seeing their, their very first Shakespearean production. And you feel this, this pressure for lack of a better word, um, to make sure that you get it right so that they want to do it again. God forbid you're working with somebody who doesn't know what the hell they're doing and they do an <laughs> audio book that is somebody's first audio book. And that person thinks, eh, no, no more. Not going to do this. I'm not going to do this again. I'm like, look, I, I got everything I want in life from audio books, right? What does everybody want? Everybody wants, uh, they want love. They want a career. They want a home. Well, you know what? My fiance is an audiobook narrator. Uh, <laughs> my career is as an audiobook narrator. I bought my house. I call it the house that books built. And I got all of it because of audiobooks. And I just want to make sure, to the extent that I can, that I help people so that when it comes their time to narrate books, that, uh, that they know how to approach it. Yep. Uh, once again, we're talking with Scott Brick. And if, again, you've got questions, we've got a few questions we're going to get to in the next half hour. So uh, you still have time to get those in there quickly, although I'm sure somebody else is going to ask about this. Your thoughts about how AI is going to uh, impact the uh, the voiceover business or the, and the, the audiobook business specifically? Um, I've been asked about this question for at least five years now. Um, 
and I know George will appreciate this. I always quote Don LaFontaine. Um, whenever somebody would ask me about AI, I would say what Don said. Um, I think he was being asked, why do you go to so much effort to you know, bring people along in the car with you on, on your way to the studio every day? Why do you bring in so many newcomers who could potentially wind up taking your jobs? And Don replied, if you're thinking about the competition, your head isn't in the game. Man. And I, I firmly believe that. And yet I have had it pointed out to me by others in the industry who don't have my track record and haven't recorded a thousand books, you know, they say, well, it's easy for you to say. So since then, what I've tried to do is, and frankly, we're doing a panel on it at, at VO Atlanta, how not to get replaced by a computer. I can't wait to show up for that one. Well, the, there was an author that I, I've worked with regularly for 20 years, and he talked about the reason that he chose me. And I've been kind of debating, like, should I even play? It was on a podcast. The two of us were on a, on a podcast. And, and I was like, Oh, this this might be helpful, but I would have, it would it would be basically an author saying nice things about me, and I don't need any help to to seem self centered, you know. I really <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to be playing like a podcast that says you know, oh, get a load of him. But the things that the author was talking about, the reason that he chose me, um, are things that AI can't do, and so um, uh, it's uh, I frankly. Tomorrow night, uh, tomorrow morning, there's going to be an article in the Wall Street Journal. I was interviewed by them about AI, mm. specifically about AI audiobooks. And I was called early this morning to verify a quote that I had given them to say there's accuracy there, but there's no soul. There's no soul. And yeah. there's something called the uncanny valley. And for those of you who are not aware of it, please look it up. Uh, um, um, it basically means that gap between, you know, what AI can do and what we need it to do. And in between, there's just no bridging that gap. No and I think, about it. I think, I think listeners, it's why I've always, in terms of my teaching, I always encourage performers to strive for authenticity rather than accuracy. And I'll, I'll define my terms. Uh, accuracy to me is, okay, uh, uh, you have to do a Hungarian accent. You go out and you put in a Meryl Streep-like amount of work to, uh, to learn the Hungarian accent. Um, that is accuracy. But if instead you gave them a hint of that, and you strive for um, authenticity, the emotional authenticity of the scene. That's something, I mean, AI can learn and train itself over and over and over and over, but they cannot feel. So um, that's what I always strive for. Go for authenticity rather than accuracy, because I think the human ear can hear in authenticity a mile away. Very good. All right. Again, you got a question for Scott Brick. Throw it in one of the chat rooms, depending on where you're watching. We've got a lot more to talk about with him because he knows more about the audiobook business than just about anybody because he does more than anybody. Anyway, we'll be right back after these important messages. So do not go away. Voice over body shop. We'll be right back. This is the Latin lover narrator from Jane the Virgin, Anthony Mendez. And you're enjoying Dan and George on the voice over body shop. Have you noticed the specific demands of clients regarding our home VO studios? Are they at a professional level to record for broadcast? And what does that mean? To me, it means it doesn't sound bad. I've seen several now demanding cardioid condenser microphones. Some are great and cheap ones not so great. So how do you choose? It's like standing in the checkout line at the supermarket deciding which candy or mints you want to buy. So which is right for you? Make it easy on yourself and get the Harlan Hogan Signature Series VO1A, the first and only mic designed for voiceover performers by a voiceover performer. The VO1A faithfully captures deep tones without sounding bassy. 
and has a silky smooth top end that's never harsh. A perfect sound palette for both male and female voiceover performers. Order yours by May Day and you'll get an ABS strap free to protect your mic from oops. Go to voiceoveressentials.com where you'll see all their great products made just for us voiceover people. Hey everybody, it's time to now continue with our sponsorship roundabout or roundup is probably the right way to put it by thanking Source Elements, the creators of Source Connect and Source Live. I would say now they're two top tools in the toolbox for remote audio production. And the tools work seamlessly together at the production side, and they can also be helpful on the acting side too. Mainly Source Connect is the one that most of you will interact with because it's the way the big studios like to record voice actors live remotely. It gives them incredibly good, consistent quality. It gives them perfect audio sync. So if you're having to record to a pre-recorded track, maybe you're doing looping or ADR or matching, you know, lip flaps, dubbing, whatever it is, it allows for all that to happen and be absolutely perfectly in sync every single time with great sound quality. And it allows that audio to stream straight into the producer's system, whether they're on Pro Tools or Logic or Nuendo, whatever system they're using, your audio flows right in. If you want to be one of those actors who has that in their toolbox and is available to be booked on those kind of projects, maybe you've got an agent, maybe you're seeing it on auditions, get ready, get prepared, go to source-elements.com and sign up for a 15-day free trial and start experimenting, learning, and getting the training. They've got it over there. And if you need an extra bit of helping hand, we do it at George the Tech as well. Thanks, Source Elements. Let's get on with the show with more sponsors and our guest, Scott Brick, right after this. So when you hear the word accents, right, you see a piece of copy with it, or there's an audition that says accents required, or maybe an audio book you want to take a stab at, what happens in your head? Do you get like, oh, I don't do accents. Nah, I'm going to pass on that one. What if you said instead, okay, let's do this. Let's figure this out. And I can show you how because I was shown how. My accent coach is Jim Johnson. He's giving away free lessons this week on the accent class and how to build accents from scratch. So just go to voheroes.com slash accents and get these free lessons. They're all this week. Next week, we'll do a Facebook Live. We'll open registration for the accents class. There'll be an early, early action bonus. But go to voheroes.com slash accents now and learn from my accent coach. That's voheroes.com slash accents. This is Bill Ratner, and you're enjoying Voice Over Body Shop with Dan Leonard and George Widom. VOBS.TV. And we are back with Scott Brick. And we got lots of questions here from our humongous worldwide audience that is just yeah. chomping at the bit to ask questions. Can George, I ask you get a the question? question? Sure, you go for it. Uh, 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 my question is, can I choose one of the questions? Because during, uh, during our commercial break, I went looking through the chat list, and there's a question I would love to answer, if, if I may. Okay, Steve, go for it. Yeah, yeah, do you want to answer a specific one first to get started? Go for a it. Specific one said, um, "What was the biggest thing you took away working with Morgan Freeman?" Uh, I got hired to do a screenwriting gig with Morgan Freeman twenty year, twenty five years ago. The biggest takeaway I got wasn't about screenwriting, although I learned a lot. Uh, the biggest takeaway I got was about voice. I'm sitting in a room with the Morgan Freeman. And, and, and of course, you know, he's got the, the, he's got the whole grandfather glasses look going, like he'll, he'll look down and he's got the, you know, the, the, the glasses down at the end of his nose. I'm like, Hey Morgan, can I ask you a question? And he goes, <laughs> which scared the shit out of me. I'm just, you know, <laughs> just, oh my God. Oh geez. You know? Um, but I said, uh, may I ask you a question? I said, what is, what do you think is your greatest strength as an actor? And he spoke about his voice, but what he was what he said was my gravitas. He says you can hear it in my voice. He says I got a voice that sounds really well lived in, a lot of miles on it. 
And I went, yes, gravitas. There's no faking that. My God, if I could fake authenticity, I would have it made. But, but I was like, okay, that's your greatest strength. And just, you know, as he's about to go back to reading my script, I said, uh, follow up. What's your greatest weakness? And he gave me the grandfather glasses again. And he said, my gravitas. <laughs> he said, sometimes you use it. Sometimes you use it and you rely on it. And I realized that was the thing. Look, we've all known guys like, you know, live announcing. You got Dave Fenoy, right? You've got uh, 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 in audiobooks, you, you look at a guy like uh, Stefan Rudnicki. These guys have got voices that sound like God is gargling with boulders and broken glass, right? They've got an incredible weapon. And yet, if that's all they're doing, it, it's, it's a failed experience. They've both told me the same thing. They've both told me independently, I have never once booked a voice. I've never once booked a job because of my voice. I booked the job because I know how to tell a story with my voice. And when Morgan Freeman said that, I've got a I got a refrigerator on my uh, I, I got a, I got a magnet on my refrigerator that says I wish my life was narrated by Morgan Freeman. Um, but to hear him say that and to be so self aware that that is both your greatest strength and your greatest weakness, I've always I just I want to have a class. Every week, where I can share that with with uh, with newcomers, mm. don't rely well, on it too great, heavily. Great piece. Of, that's a great story. You know, if Nor Morgan Freeman was narrating my life, it would be a lot more interesting. So, <laughs> It'd be a lot funnier for me, yeah, certainly. Right, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Well, the first question in the queue, because it was written in to the guys at VOBS.TV because they wanted to be in the front of the queue, is from Craig Roberts. George, you get it. Yeah, he says, uh, hello, Scott, back in the day, long, long ago, when the world was wholly monochrome and hi-fi sound was a thing, I was a pretty successful VO actor and narrator. I strayed into broadcast journalism and for some decades, but returned to freelance voice work about a year and a half ago, primarily in audiobooks. I'm just finishing my 21st project, but all, all, but, all but six have been in the self-publishing realm. The uh, other half dozen were for small, a small specialty publisher. So my question is, how does one break into the major publishing world? And how is self-promotion and marketing to the majors done these days? And what's the secret? <laughs> great, great question. Um, when you were at the point in your career, when you were not making as much money, when you're working on projects that are, you know, independently, published and produced um, you have to be forward thinking I always I always say to people I'm playing the long game right or if, when I'm feeling a bit more uh, uh, <laughs> cynical I say I'm playing the long con um, <laughs> by that I mean I have always known what kind of books I wanted to do and when people come into the industry, sometimes they will be offered a job that they might not ordinarily want to work on. I worked with a woman once who's gifted, British actress. Um, she needed to make money. And uh, she uh, came to me for a business consult. And I said, well, what is it? You know, what are you looking for? What do you want to do? And she said, I, I want to, and of course, in her plummy English accent, she said, I want to be the person that all of the publishers call when they need to redo, do another version of Jane Austen. And I thought, okay, great. And so uh, we finished our, our meeting and I went, I looked her up before our next meeting. And when I typed her name into Audible, she had done about 20 books to uh, maybe bring it back around to, you know, where you are in your career. But she had taken the low-hanging fruit. She had done a lot of erotica and didn't realize that she should use a pseudonym. And uh, the very first title that came up under her name was Bend Me Over. <laughs> I'm, not here, I'm not here to poke fun at her. She, she yeah. took a job. She got paid for it. All good. Um, 
I will admit that there was a part of me that goes, oh, I know all the people at Audible and I just looked this up. Oh, they're going to see my search history. Um, but nevertheless, <laughs> fact of the matter is she took the low hanging fruit. And I had to tell her a very uncomfortable truth that, you know, if Simon and Schuster or Harper or Penguin Random House wants to do a new version of Jane Austen, they're not going to hire the woman who did bend me over. So what you have to do is as you are doing these low paying gigs, maybe it's a, it's a revenue share. You have to choose books that are the kind of books you want to be doing, because even if they don't sell, what you do is you make sure that there is a, a really good sample indicative of your best skills. You put that up on your website and you send it out to everybody and you let them know, I did this book recently and I think it's more indicative of, of, of my skill level than the last sample that I sent you. You always lead with the work that you want to be doing. Uh, Hillary Huber, I mentioned her before. Hillary Huber had a wonderful uh, saying. She said, uh, the industry opens up the door. The industry lays out the welcome mat in a different place for everybody. Your job is the moment the welcome mat gets laid out, walk through the door. And once you're in the door, go left, go right, go straight, go you know, diagonally, whatever. Go towards where you want to be. Lead with what you want. And that's typically how you, if you can do that with the jobs where you're cutting your teeth, getting your sea legs under you, um, if you can do that on those, when you send a sample to publishers, they'll go, oh, and they will think of you for that kind of job in that particular genre. Hmm. Great answer. Uh, Jeff Holman asks, last time I saw you, maybe this is a little personal, but last time I saw you, you mentioned that you were having gastrointestinal issues that made it difficult to record hmm. sometimes. Are you doing better? He also has issues with his stomach making noises sometimes. How do you deal well, with that? Bless him. Yes, <laughs> I did. I had this, I had this bizarre syndrome. Nobody could figure it out for two years. It's called gastroparesis and your stomach just basically forgets how to do its work. I gained 40 pounds in all of this. Um, I know that we're, we deal with a, a, a sedentary lifestyle, but still it was like my stomach just wasn't doing its job. And um, I've had a couple of uh, uh, very encouraging meetings recently, and I am not dealing with the stomach issues or the stomach upset. Uh, I won't go into the details, um, but I am not dealing with it as much as I was two years ago. Uh, I appreciate you asking, and I am grateful every day that, don't want to jinx it, but it's been for the last month, it's been in my rearview mirror. So Good, good to hear. George? That's good to hear. Yeah. Larry on YouTube with a question, are audiobook narrations ever live recordings? And if so, do you have any advice for when an actor is struggling with a performance and needs to take a short break so they can reset during a remote recording session? Um, yeah, if you need to reset, um, you can handle it a couple of different ways. Um, um, why? And, by, and by live, you know, I, I don't know if he, in, you know, live means a few things. Does that mean yeah. literally live streaming like a performance like we are at this moment? Or does he mean live recording with a studio who's listening to him I while think, performing? You know? Right. If that's the case, then it's being done like an old time radio show. Right. And there's nothing really that you can do. Um, but if if you if it's not going to be coming out for weeks or months uh, after you do your work, um, my first recommendation is to lie <laughs> and tell your your um, engineer, your producer, your director. Hey, uh, give me a minute. I uh, uh, sorry, I I've got you know whatever it is. I got my doctor calling on the phone. I I got I have to run to the restroom. Forgive me. And then when you come back, come up with an excuse to start over. But it's important that you do this early on. Now, I have done the opposite. 
I recorded an entire book by Brad Meltzer. Um, uh, Brad Meltzer is a, a thriller writer, and I had never read any of his work. It was his third book. It was called The First Council, and they flew me to New York to record it 20 years ago, and I had to do this new to me uh, recording technique called the punch and roll which I'm assuming a lot of people in the audience know what I'm talking about, but it's essentially editing on the fly. I had never done it before. I had no idea what the hell I was doing. And I was so conscious of, you know, taking a deep breath. Like, are they going to have to edit that out? Am mm -hmm. I going to, you know, are they, are they going to have to stop recording and then, you know, punch in from my breath? So like, okay, okay. All right. Well, I'm listening to the three seconds of playback. I'll take my breath. And then when they're recording, I'm, I just I just go into it with that. I had no idea. I was concentrating so much on the technical side of things yeah. that I lost track of, well, the authenticity to go back to. I was, I was striving for accuracy rather than authenticity to go back to my earlier metaphor. And um, the opening of this book was unique because it was, it was a first-person narrative and it was very funny, and it was uh, at, and at times poignant. And it basically ran along the lines of, I'm afraid of spiders. I'm afraid of snakes. I'm afraid of the evil clown that lives under my bed and only comes out at night. I'm afraid of disappointing my father. I'm afraid of the cancer that killed my mother. On and on. I, I, there was even, a, I'm afraid of the cultural significance of Barbie dolls. You know, it, 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 it was all over the place. It was an entire page. And that's how long ago it was. It was an actual eight and a half by 11 printed out page. And at the end of this long run on sentence, which was a whole page, a whole paragraph, it said, but I'm not afraid of power, which is why I work in the White House. <laughs> and isn't that a marvelous setup? It right? is. It's poignant. It's funny. And it's, it, it, it challenges you like, oh, shit, where are we going to go now? So I, to, to get back to the question, I recorded that entire book. And it was nagging at me all week long that that first day I was w worried too much about the technical aspect of things. So what I did, and again, you don't have this option if you're doing it live in front of a studio audience, but because this was going to be edited, I told our producer, our director, I said, Hey, uh, and he's getting up and he's walking out of the booth. He's like, okay, nice working with you. And I said, Hey, no, hang on, hang on. Uh, I need to re-record the first page. And he says to me, no, you don't. I say, yes, I do. He goes, no, you don't. You got it right. And I said, you can die, right? I got the, I got the words correct. I got them in the right order. I pronounced them correctly but I didn't understand the character. I need to re-record that opening page. And I swear to God, he gave me this big, long, drawn out, fine. <laughs> yeah, it's like <laughs> somebody and, wouldn't and, want to go down for lunch. Right. Yeah. And, and I, cause it, look, it was Friday night, you know, Friday late afternoon and he wanted to go home and, and I get it. But I worry about all the other narrators that he worked with over the years because I was brand new. But I wasn't going to take shit from anybody. I don't do that now, but I was the same back then at the beginning of my career. I'm like, oh, screw yourself. I need to do this, okay? This is going to be the best way to do this project. Years go by, and that author, Brad Meltzer, uh, we were at an event. It was about 10 years ago, and somebody asked him. Uh, he was up on stage speaking and they said how did you choose your audiobook narrator and he said i wanted to find somebody who got me he said i had two books two different narrators i wasn't really impressed with either one of them because it just didn't sound like they understood me but that one book that i did the first council i knew that that opening page was a challenge unlike any other and i knew that if they got it whoever it was they hired to do it if they if they could get through that page, then they got me. <laughs> and that is the only reason that it's 20 years later and I've done 20 books by Brad Meltzer. 
he would have fired me like he did the first two if I had not gone back and said and made a fuss and said, I need to redo this. Even if it was only at the very beginning, just so that people's first impression, the first time they hear my voice working with the author's words, that it synced. So that would be my advice. Again, very long answer to a very short question. That would be my advice. Make sure that you are happy with it. And if you need to redo something, redo it. We're not wasting tape anymore. Yep. No, no, it's really, there's no tape. Uh, anyway, Scott, thanks so much for, for joining us again. We've been wanting to have you on for some time and, uh, the, the pandemic just gets in the way of everything, but now it we're does. getting back out. Uh, if people want to get a hold of you for some of your training, where would they write or where would they communicate with you? Scottbrick.com, scottbrick.net. Um, if you go to, uh, uh, my website, uh, in the upper left-hand corner, the little box uh, that you click, um, uh, there's, I think there's one for coaching Then there's one for events. Like if I'm doing, uh, classes or something like video at Atlanta, um, it's, it, it's typically, uh, uh, those buttons have all the information for, you know, whatever you need. Very good. All righty. Thanks for being here, Scott. Really appreciate it. And it's a pleasure. Yeah. Just make sure to send me that, uh, that key because I'm, I might need your bathroom in another okay. hour and a half well, or so. It, okay. Well, if you're driving by, just, you, you know, where I am. See you in anyway. a few days. We'll see you in Atlanta. Absolutely. Can't wait. Looking forward to it. All righty. George and I will be right back to wrap things up into a nice tight little ball right after this and get set up for tech talk too. You're still watching VLBS. <laughs> Your dynamic voiceover career requires extra resources to keep moving ahead. There's one place where you can explore everything the voiceover industry has to offer. That place is voiceoverextra.com. Whether you're just exploring a voiceover career or a seasoned veteran ready to reach that next professional level, stay in touch with market trends, coaching, products, and services while avoiding scams and other pitfalls. VoiceOver Extra has hundreds of articles, free resources, and training that will save you time and help you succeed. Learn from the most respected talents, coaches, and industry insiders when you join the online sessions, bringing you the most current information on topics like audiobooks, auditioning, home studio setup, and equipment, marketing, performance techniques, and much more. It's time to hit your one-stop daily resource for voiceover success. Sign up for a free subscription to newsletters and reports. It's all here at voiceoverextra.com. That's voiceoverxtra.com. In these modern times, every business needs a website. When you need a website for your voice acting business, there's only one place to go. Like the name says, voiceactorwebsites.com. Their experience in this niche webmaster market gives them the ability to quickly and easily get you from concept to live online in a much shorter time. When you contact voiceactorwebsites.com, their team of experts and designers really get to know you and what your needs are. They work with you to highlight what you do. Then they create an easily navigable website for your potential clients to get the big picture of who you are and how your voice is the one for them. Plus, voiceactorwebsites.com has other great resources like their practice script library and other resources to help your voiceover career flourish. Don't try it yourself. Go with the pros. Voiceactorwebsites.com, where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. Are the World Voices Organization, also, also known, known as, as Wovo. Wovo. We're the not-for-profit industry association of freelance voice talent. VoiceOver is a complex entrepreneurial business. Wovo is there to promote the professional nature of voice work to the public, to those already established in their voiceover practice, and to those who want to pursue voiceover as a career. Membership benefits include a supportive and creative community, community. a profile and demos on voiceover.biz, our searchable directory of vetted professional voice talent, our exclusive demo player for your personal website our mentoring program business resources and our video library our annual wovocon conference a fun and educational weekend with other members with a chance to learn and and network network. webinars and great speakers and weekly social chats with other members around the world if your world is voiceover make wovo part of it 
World Voices Organization. We, we speak, speak for those who speak, speak for a living. Yeah, hi, this is Carlos Ellis Rocky, the voice of Rocco, and you're watching Voice Over Body Shop. I think it's always great when we run into Scott Brick. Whether we're it's in a restaurant or on the street or at a conference, always a, always great to run into him because he's Absolutely. got all the right answers. Anyway, next week on this very show that you are watching right now, we'll be doing Tech Talk number 99. Believe it or not. 99. Right. And if you've got if you've got a question, a tech question for us, now would be a super duper time to throw it in one of our chat rooms whether you are in Facebook or on YouTube Live or LinkedIn. Got That's right. LinkedIn is that now happening. Bit. That's right. So uh and then we've got some other great guests coming up. Uh, and, and we may be, we may record a segment in, in Atlanta too, because there'll be lots of great people there. Oh, that's uh, for sure. Let's see here. We need to thank uh, our donors of the week, by the way, uh, like Grace Newton, Robert Leadham, Stephen Chandler, Crazy Clack, Casey Jonathan, Clack, even. Casey <laughs> Clack. Pulling a Trump there. Jonathan Grant. <laughs> oh, man. Thomas Pinto. Greg Thomas. A Dr. Voice. Antland Productions. Martha Kahn. 949 Designs. Christopher Epperson. Sarah Borges. Philip Sapir. Brian Page. Patty Gibbons. Rob Raider. Shauna Pennington Baird. Don Griffith. Trey Mosley. Diana Birdsall. And, and Sandra, Sandra Manwiller. Man I uh, need to thank our sponsors too. Harlan Hogan's VoiceOver Essentials. VoiceOver Extra. Source Elements. VOHeroes.com. VoiceActor.com. And WorldVoices.org. The Industry Association of Freelance Voice Talent. Yes, That's I'm right. president. Yeah, it's, but that, you don't have to worry about that. I <laughs> uh, need to thank Jeff Holman for doing a great job in the chat room tonight. Lots of great questions, folks. And of course, of course, Sue Merlino, our amazing director who gets it all done and uh, makes it all look like an actual TV show. Uh, and before we go, I just want to remind you, yes. we have a coupon code at George the Tech that expires ah. at the end of March. It's, it's our biggest coupon we do, 20% off everything on the website. So to get that, it's GTT2, numeral 2, point, P-O-I-N-T-O-H. GT2 2.0 gives you 20% off and that expires March 31st. And there's three more spots left at VO Atlanta for my X session on Thursday at noon. If you want to get into my mic to MP3 training from start to finish three hours of 12 people, pretty intimate group. Three hours of George Woodham. I, I'm going to have to <laughs> poke my head in there when I, when I arrive <laughs> anyway, uh, well, that's going to do it for us this week. And thanks again to Scott Brick for joining us and giving us his wisdom on audiobooks. Uh, we're going to re rack it now for Tech Talk because you're here live. You can stick around and you can ask your tech questions, which I think is really cool. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, you know, this is not an easy business voiceover, audiobooks, all this stuff. There's so much to know. But George and I have really come to cut it down to this. If it sounds good, it is good. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver Body Shop or VO BS. See you next week. Later.